Hello, I'm Benjamin Taylor. I'm the Chief Executive of the Public Service Transformation Academy and I want to make this conversation as much of a conversation as it can be uh, with the constraints of technology and the virus. Um, so please do uh, contact me, follow up on social media. Um, I'm Antlerboy on um, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter uh, for reasons I won't go into now and I thought we could use the hashtag commissioning is dead. If you agree, if you disagree, um, if you're interested in the concept please follow up and let's make this part of a conversation. So why do I say commissioning is dead? Um, and I do celebrate it, you know, with the end of the Lansley reforms in health, with um, a move away from a negative competitive only view of commissioning as the purchaser provider split, we are into a new world where that kind of idea about commissioning is dead. That's why I say long live commissioning, because the new kind of collaborative approach that I think can really achieve transformational outcomes is actually exactly what commissioning has always been trying to be and trying to achieve. And um, as I say, I speak for the Public Service Transformation Academy today. We are a not-for-profit social enterprise, a partnership made up of all of these organizations, which amongst other things, delivers the Cabinet Office Commissioning Academy, which has been running now for kind of nearly 10 years, uh, I, I guess. Um, this is what most people think of when they think of commissioning. We call this commissioning 1.0 and this is very much um, a straightforward, you know, kind of plan, do, review, analyze cycle which is predicated on the concept of spending money to buy services. Um, and there are a number of problems with this approach, even though you probably still need to be good at doing this if you're buying kind of long-term contracted services building a hospital, something of that nature. The planning takes a long time. It's dry, analytical, abstracted from the realities of the complexities of people's lives. The procurement process takes a long time. And while all that's going on, the budget's decreased and the needs have increased. And then you end up extending and, and simplifying, standardizing and buying for a longer period of time at a higher volume, whatever you're buying, um, which then restricts what you're actually doing to meet people's needs and increases the overall costs. All of that <laughs> means that the contract managing and the learning the lessons takes a back seat and only can happen at the end of the kind of seven year contract as you go into the one year contract extension to prepare your OG notice for the next round. So while there's value in this, and I call this strategic procurement really, rather than commissioning. Um, I think this commissioning 1.0 is dead um, and in the past um, and, and over. Um, it was uh, something of a step forward at the time. And I think that's good news for commissioning people and for procurement people, because we can move into a new and more effective way of thinking about things. Of course, that cycle was never really true. As, as you can see on the left hand side, um, a good commissioner was always spinning all of those plates at once across a portfolio of things. They were planning, doing, reviewing. They were thinking about the outcomes that were needed, how the need and demand were changing, what the market could offer, um, what current services were achieving or not achieving. And if I take go back probably about 10 years, um, this graphic on the right, the blue one, um, was done by the Institute for Government. And this was talking about uh, a shift from insourcing versus outsourcing and commissioning seen as outsourcing to commissioning 1.0, which was a competitive um, thing where we were spending our money and trying to get the best value for closely defined services that were based on um, process, not on outputs or, 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 or outcomes. And at that stage, it was envisaged that there would be a, a move to commissioning 2.0. Um, we can see all the buzzwords here, personalized, shared, pooled, collaborative, preventative, co-production, co-creation. And that's still needed, frankly. We run all these commissioning academies and um, so often the participants there, participants there who are towards the you know more um, progressive edge of what they do have very few examples of true commissioning 2.0. Um, so that shift still hasn't happened and we have the opportunity to really make that happen now. Um, the other thing that we talk about uh, is that means really moving from thinking about fundamentally spending our money to buy services, seeing ourselves as the center of the universe, our money is what brings all of the realities of public services uh, into existence, the commissioner is kind of a god, to actually thinking about how we are helping systems to shape to achieve better outcomes. That involves thinking about um, 
the purpose that people have in their lives that they're trying to achieve that sometimes gives rise to a need that sometimes gives rise to a demand on public services because um our definition of, of public service is that it co-creates value always with the customer and for the customer, obviously. And our mission is to reduce the effort, time, cost steps, all the crap from the need arising to the positive outcome. Now, that might sound like lean, efficient, effective services. And yes, often that's a good thing. But actually, I want you to cheat. And I'm going to explain in a minute what I mean by that. Um, uh, and I want you to achieve better than just minimizing the gap from customer need to positive outcome. Um, this is often what it looks like. Not a lot of public services have a really good analytical strategic view of their overall demand, um, but uh, even those that do, that's not the most motivating thing, transacting demand, and it's always too much. It's too expensive, we haven't got the budget, there's just too much demand out there. The, the natural response is to shift back into control, which is even more demoralizing, waiting lists, uh, queuing, uh, changing our um, uh, entitlement criteria. That's a bit like building a dam. Um, and that dam actively stops um, uh, the demand only for a short space of time because, you know, the demand overtops the dam and starts to come through at the same rate again but some people who are stuck behind the dam never get the help or it flows around the edges in all kinds of other ways of getting through to the service or it breaks the whole dam and we're deluged because the need has, and has built up over time um, and got even more significant if we look behind the demand it's only when people have a need in their life that they create that demand on public services um, and meeting needs is more powerful and it's more empowering, it's more inspiring, but it's also a little bit heroic. And there's that big risk that the more you meet people's needs in public services, the more they come, the more you come to um, want them to need you, if you see what I mean. There's that codependency thing there. Behind needs are the purposes that people are trying to achieve in life. So if we can actually help people to achieve their purposes in life, even though we still have to deal with the demand and sometimes we have to control, unfortunately, there's all the world of difference between thinking about how we're actually helping people to achieve their purpose versus just dealing with the demand um, that's coming in. And that's the cheating. Because if our goal is to reduce the steps between need and the outcome, if we can empower citizens, individuals, communities, places, to meet their own needs by shaping the system so that they have that control and that capability, then we can do ourselves out of a job. Um, and for me, that's the work and that's the joy in public service transformation and what commissioning is all about if we can just focus on helping people achieve their purpose. This is another model that's been around for 10 years as well from Richard Selwyn. And what this says is that that different outcome focused view of commissioning is about thinking about in real terms, in their words, in their understanding, with them telling you whether you've met their purpose or not, <laughs> um, are we achieving your outcomes? So asking questions like, have we made your life better? Did we do what you needed today? That's what keeps us honest. Those are the self-correcting measures. Um, and uh, there's no getting around it. There's no cheating and doing proxies. Uh, there's no saying, well, we did our best, but the outcomes weren't necessarily achieved actually measure yourself by citizens outcomes then start to think about how you can intervene how you can shape the system how you can marshal resources that are not just seen as our budget because in any human outcome system in any way of thinking about what people really need in their lives our budget is a tiny proportion of what really makes the difference actually it's the way people live their lives, it's the it's the, the capital spend embedded in the area, it's voluntarism, it's what the markets can offer, it's what communities and voluntary sector can do for themselves. And if you can do many of those interventions that learn quickly in a short space of time, you build a much richer learning loop than trying to learn from big contracts. Um, the other really big step that I think uh, the death of commissioning opens up for us is the possibility of actually not being focused on needs and deficits, but starting from an appreciation of the assets, of, of the strengths that people and communities have. And we're starting to see that come through much more clearly, much more richly now as we move to sort of 
more sophisticated outcome based commissioning to asset aware and using assets to break, maybe save a bit of money because our budgets are reducing bolting it on to actually an asset based approach i don't think as with a lot of this that we've really got there yet but the way we saw communities mobilize and support themselves and we tried not always successfully to build on that in the epidemic is a really good example so we say there are five fundamental questions for transformation and for commissioning first you know understand the system w uh, that you're investigating what, what what's the system of interest and how is it part of a bigger system uh, and really understand the key issues in delivery today what's strong and what's wrong what might be causing those problems and that's in a way a bit of a red herring because we're not so interested in that that's just the way to meet all the stakeholders build a coalition build willingness um, build engagement um, have people able to work together because question two is the humdinger what is this system actually there to try and achieve is it to process housing benefit claims within 10 days or is it to create an area where people are prosperous and safe in their homes if you want to do the latter playing on a bigger stage is a big theme of um, where I think commissioning can go now it's dead um, if you want to achieve the latter you still probably need to run an efficient and effective housing benefits service but you're thinking about it in a very different context and in a very different way. Once you understand the purpose you're trying to achieve, then you can work out how, what activity would we do to deliver it? What vehicle? Is that outsourced? Is it in-house? Is it just the voluntary sector can do it themselves? Do they need a bit of support, et cetera, et cetera? So for us, that's the key question. How are we achieving our purpose, which is to help citizens achieve their purpose? That takes us into systems change. It takes us into learning about systems. And this is the, the this is the big kind of I hesitate to say paradigm shift, but it's something like that. Moving from saying, well, we did our bit, the world changed and the outcomes for the community were really quite crap, but we're not responsible for that. It's taking responsibility for the actual outcomes of the whole system. What difference would that shift make to you uh, in and your um, and your services? Moving from seeing ourselves as central to the whole thing to being um, a humble part of a much bigger, much more complex system. From seeing ourselves as the source of power in the system to seeing ourselves as potentially having impact. From using money to buy services to shaping systems to achieve outcomes. From that cold analytical data to what Nora Bateson calls the warm data of people's lives. What is really meaningful to them and how are they leading their lives? In the, in the, in the pandemic, we found out so much about the people who we thought were vulnerable but turned out not to be because they had good neighbors and support networks and the people who we didn't think were vulnerable but turned out to be very vulnerable it means changing from thinking of ourselves as experts to thinking of ourselves as learners and moving to a shared responsibility across the whole system for those outcomes for people Kurt Levin many many years ago said you never understand the system until you start to try to change it and that's absolutely true and you can achieve if you're lucky um, three levels of learning so if our identity the way we see ourselves that I've just been talking about really um, affects the way we think about situations which affects our actions which determine our outcomes or our results then the first level of learning is just can we do the same better can we deliver services differently and, and better the second level is should we be thinking about the situation very differently and the third level is when our identity, our view of ourself fundamentally changes. So I always use the example of firefighters. The single loop learning is getting better and better at fighting fires, dragging people out of burning buildings, etc. Still needed, still important, still good to do. But the double loop comes in when somebody says, wouldn't it be better if we stopped the house fires from happening in the first place? Um, and then you get into prevention. And you get into, uh, you know, literally going out to old people's homes, mostly because they're the most vulnerable and checking the batteries in their smoke alarms. And that's when the identity shift becomes possible, because then you change from this very macho, heroic, literally firefighting model, which, as I say, is not completely discarded. We still need to be good at that. Goodness knows we've seen a hor horrific example of that with Grenfell. Um, but if we change from that 
macho heroic identity to being really good at engaging with people so they let you in their homes and they respect you and they listen and you can help them to help themselves and protect themselves not just the batteries and the smoke alarm but why not help them with the co2 risk why not look for slips and trips hazards why not look for other signs of of, of hazard um, and so on then we can achieve so much more um, so once again, the PSTA is here to support public services to build their own capability to respond. We have all kinds of material and obviously we offer academies, um, lots and lots of stuff that's good practice material that will help you to uh, face these challenges. But most importantly, um, as I said at the start, let's make this a conversation. Please come back to me. I'm Ant the Boy. My real name is Benjamin Taylor. And I thought we'd use the hashtag commissioning is dead. I'd love to hear what you think about that proposition and how we can take it forward together to achieve better outcomes for public services and for citizens. Thank you very much.